Hey everyone, and welcome to another Kanoa Reviews. Today we take a look at the classic Nintendo 64 platformer, Donkey Kong 64, which will be my very last review of 2020. This might seem to come out of nowhere, but for me I have always associated this game with Christmas. Not necessarily because the game has anything to do with Christmas, on the contrary, it's all in a tropical jungle setting of course, but rather, I got this game as a present back when I was 9 years old. Therefore. I have very fond memories of playing this game as I sat next to the Christmas tree during those cold, snowy days, or playing this as slowly throughout the day family members came to visit to celebrate the holidays together. It honestly is a game I associate with a simpler, maybe even a happier time, when I was just a kid and the world wasn't so complicated or hateful with everyone staring at each other's throat for having a different opinion. Friends of mine also have games which gives them some of those Christmas or holiday vibes since they receive them with Christmas, so I'm definitely curious to what some of those games are for you, if you have any games that you associate with Christmas in any way or form. I would love to read everyone's stories in the comments down below. So let's jump into the game, shall we? When it comes to platformers, no console comes close to delivering classics like the Nintendo 64. The PlayStation 2 and GameCube have definitely their share of must-plays, but my love for 3D platformers was shaped by the console generation before it. Games like Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, Congress Bad Fur Day, Rayman 2 and Tonic Trouble are some of the coolest entries we got back in the day. Rare, in those times, was also one heck of a powerhouse when it came to developers. Almost everything that Rare made was pure gold. From the earlier mentioned platformers like Banjo-Kazooie and Conker's Bad Fur Day, to shooters like Jet Force Gemini or Goldeneye. And so everyone was excited when they would return to their old form with a new Donkey Kong game, but this time in 3D. On the Super Nintendo, the Donkey Kong games were of course instant hits, and I remember playing the first Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo at my cousin's place. Since they had already established their know-how of 3D platformers with the successful Banjo-Kazooie, the masses expected a step up from that game. Now everyone pretty much agrees that Donkey Kong 64 does not reach that same height as Banjo-Kazooie does, and I think I figured out why by replaying this after so many years. But before we talk about that, let's do a deep dive of what the gameplay exactly entails. The story of Donkey Kong 64 isn't really anything to speak of, but of course that is never really the focus with platformers. The ever so evil K. Rule has kidnapped Donkey Kong's friends and stolen all of his golden bananas. Now it's up to Donkey Kong to free them and collect all those golden bananas back of which there are more than 150 to collect. The first thing one notices when turning on the game is just how funny and stylized the game is. Before the start screen even appears, there's a really catchy intro cinematic where a full rap song about DK and his friends is being performed. The animations are great for the time, and due to the use of the expansion pack, the game stands as one of the prettier Nintendo 64 games. Character models are all very characteristic and nice looking, with great effects like dynamic shadows and lighting. This is another one of those examples where the cartoony nature really benefits this game from feeling timeless. Realistic looking human characters like in Perfect Dark or Goldeneye have aged horribly over the years, but cartoony characters like this have such exaggerated proportions and looks that it feels like a cartoon both 21 years ago and today. The animations complement that feeling with certain moves, enlarging, stretching or inflating certain body parts like arms and legs when one punches or jumps really high. The music is of course also a highlight, as is in almost any rare game even in the ones today. It definitely has that rare feeling though, which you know from other games as those same style of trumpets, pan flutes and xylophones are being brought from the attic again. But many of the tunes are just so catchy and get stuck in your head before you even know it. So presentation wise the game gets an absolute 10, and still holds up very much today. Once you gain control of Donkey Kong and get sent out into the hub world, you are free to explore the island area, which looks very bright, colorful and pleasant. Since the focus is of course on apes, you get some expected gameplay along the likes with climbing trees or vines and swinging from ropes. The hub world works like pretty much most platform games back in those days, with you heading to several areas spread throughout where something is blocking you from entering a level until you have collected enough stars, puzzle pieces or in this case, golden bananas. In Mario, there were of course the doors that told you how many stars you needed to have. 
Banjo Kazooie had the number of puzzle pieces missing from the paintings, and in Donkey Kong there's a sign with eyes that tells you how many bananas it wants before getting out of your way and letting you head towards the new level. Now the first level is very fun and has your classic jungle feel to it, with caves, a lovely small river area and forested zones. You are free to explore the whole level at your leisure, though you will often run into blockades where a button or icon will appear, which means you will have to use an ability or character you haven't unlocked yet. I noticed this gameplay style is something very frequently done by Rare, even up to its fault with a game like Ukulele, where you run into so many blockades in areas you have to come back later to, that it feels very much like a chore and a trial and error situation. Banjo Kazooie had this too, where in some levels you had some icons like the rubber boots or the flying ability, and if you hadn't unlocked those abilities yet, you could not proceed in that certain area. You would have to come back later to that level once you did unlock the ability and get a golden puzzle piece that way. But since you were always controlling one character, Banjo, and the number of abilities you unlocked weren't that many, it was all very foreseeable and clear. In Donkey Kong 64, however, they upped the ante by a lot, and there's actually a lot of different things you have to unlock to really be able to explore the levels to their full potential. In all honesty, I am not a big fan of this approach, at least not when it's done so excessive as in this game or ukulele. With Donkey Kong 64, you have certain areas where you can only proceed if you have unlocked a certain character, of which there are five. Other areas you can only head towards if you unlocked and bought a certain ability for a specific character, of which there are many. Then there are certain areas where you can only go to if you have unlocked a specific weapon for a specific character, of which there are five. And then lastly, there are areas you can only move to when you have unlocked a specific music instrument for that specific character, of which there are once again five. Phew! It honestly all feels a bit much and kind of like a chore to all unlock before being able to really enjoy it to its full potential. To unlock those abilities, instruments and weapons, you need to collect banana coins that are spread throughout the level. Once you have enough, you head towards the various huts belonging to fan favorite characters like Cranky or Funky Kong, and in exchange for the coins they will teach you the new abilities and then can head towards the entire new areas within the many levels. Now as I said, once you do have all those abilities, exploring the levels and going everywhere is an absolute blast and you feel like nothing is stopping you. But until that time, you will come across a lot of areas where the game will simply block your progress and you will have to head back and maybe head down a different hallway or tunnel. I prefer the ability to fully explore an area from the get-go, like in Mario 64 or Odyssey. But at least the positive thing about Donkey Kong 64 is, by having this formula, there is always something on your to-do list. You may not be able to progress in a certain area to get another golden banana, but then at least you can have multiple focuses like unlocking new characters or collecting more bananas or banana coins. There's always something to do, even though it will keep you from exploring the entirety of the level. Now each Kong has 5 golden bananas to collect in each level, meaning there are a whopping 25 to collect in each, which is a lot more than your average Mario level. This is very cool because once you do have the abilities unlocked, you can sometimes have 3 or 4 different areas you want to explore and see what you need to do to collect the next banana. As with many platformers back then, you get the golden bananas as the reward by completing a certain task or puzzle. These can be very simple, from shooting buttons with DK's coconut gun that are spread throughout the level, to more complex tasks like following and repeating a very unique piano play performed by the baddies, or completing certain minigames like going through a maze, riding a minecart and collecting coins, or guiding a fairy by knocking out crocodiles that might eat them. Often the number one rule with platformers is to offer varied gameplay, as that keeps it fresh and entertaining throughout, and Donkey Kong 64 definitely succeeds in that. The earlier mentioned minigames are often very fun and engaging, and actually get pretty hard at a certain point. You will do races, collect coins, sneak around and avoid enemies, or battle it out against certain foes. In the levels themselves, you often will need to use the different characters' unique abilities to reach points only they can access, and collect the golden bananas that way. Diddy Kong, for example, can use a jetpack and reach very high tops and peaks where often bananas will be hidden. Or Lanky Kong can do a handstand and walk up steep slopes where he can then collect the prize. Tiny Kong, which for the longest time I thought to be Dixie Kong, 
can make herself small and enter areas that way or fly through the air and reach platforms that are further than others. Spreading out these different abilities over these five characters is actually very smart. Technology was of course a bit limited back then, and so often characters you played as in games did not have that many moves. The controller, for example, had also less buttons than we have nowadays. But by having five characters with each unique abilities, it actually feels like you have a whole arsenal of different moves at your disposal. It's a great way to add more variety and solve that earlier mentioned issue of the technical limitations. Switching between characters is also easy, as you only need to head towards one of the barrels spread throughout the levels and then can switch. It's a process that takes mere seconds and never gets tedious. It's fun to constantly switch and explore the level as all the characters, since you will see all these colorful bananas and coins everywhere that you can only pick up if you have that specific character under your control. So if you play as Donkey Kong, you will be only able to pick up the yellow bananas and coins, but can still see the items for the other characters, like Diddy's red bananas and coins, or Chunky's green ones. You can then whenever you want switch to those characters and collect the items you saw earlier. Donkey Kong 64 honestly sometimes felt like the ultimate Metroidvania platformer, since you keep coming back to areas you visited earlier, but as I said, as long as you have the abilities unlocked, it's actually really fun to come back and explore. Now collecting the regular small bananas spread throughout everywhere is also very important and I always love it when games do this. See, in many of the Mario games, it doesn't really matter if you collect all the coins in the levels. Sure, you get a 1-up if you collect 100, but since Game Over wasn't that much of a big deal, it did not have a huge impact if you did or didn't. But in each level with Donkey Kong 64, you will need to of course face a boss as well. To unlock these boss stages, you will have to feed bananas you collect throughout to a hippo so he can become fatter and fatter and by its weight alone, catapult a pig up towards unlocking the door towards the boss. I know it sounds kind of insane, and it kinda is, but it makes sense when you play it. Though you only need a few bananas in the first stages, they soon require hundreds of bananas, and so you need to collectively use all of your characters to collect the bananas to unlock the stages. It gives purpose to collect all those bananas, which are this game's equivalent of the coins. The bosses themselves are quite unique and fun, can even become quite challenging. They often require to time a moment of opportunity to throw a barrel of TNT to a very large enemy while dodging it attacks in the moments in between. You honestly do not get a whole lot of leeway in between these attacks, and if you slack with running and dodging, the game will definitely punish you. So overall, the game is just chock full of content and will keep you busy for hours and hours on end. I haven't even talked about the various colored big enemies in each level, which give you a blueprint which will reward you with a banana for each character as well. When it comes to playtime and things to collect and unlock, there's a lot more to do here compared to Banjo-Kazooie. But I do have to say, when one puts this game next to those earlier mentioned Banjo-Kazooie and Congress Bad Fur Day, then this title is not as good as those two. Now that does not mean that this game is bad, on the contrary, I really recommend it and it's a very good platformer at that. But it does not reach that must play golden standard that Banjo Kazooie and Conquer did. And the main reason for this is the lackluster level design. Yes, I do think it's fun to explore the levels because there's a lot to do and see, but the levels themselves are really forgettable and lack imagination when it comes to their looks and feel. Banjo-Kazooie has incredible level design, and even though I haven't played that game in years either, I can still see those levels before my very eyes, like the Pirate Cove level with its sunny beaches and a terrifying shark out in the water, or the Desert level with its cartoony looking sphinx, or the Snow level with its giant Christmas tree and aggressive top hat wearing snowman. Or what about the Horror level with its terrifying mansion and walking gravestones which are unkillable. These unique feeling levels are honestly really missing from Donkey Kong 64. This game too has a desert level, and a factory level, and a water focus level, but many of them just feels like arena type areas connected between tunnels and narrow caves. The Aztec focus desert level has some temples etc, but they all look and feel the same. The water level has some lakes, but once again they feel similar throughout the entire level rather than offering unique sightings. Same can be said about the factory level, which is just you running through the same mechanical looking hallways and entering the same looking rooms over and over again. 
and in some ways it can even disencourage the feeling of exploration, since rather than an open level to explore, it feels like smaller areas connected by tunnels and halls, not an actual open world to sink your teeth into. Since there are so many mini-games that transport you to a different zone as well, it might indeed be clear that not as much effort was put into the levels themselves to make them feel as unique, and it's a shame too, since in Donkey Kong License is bound to have some awesome looking visuals and spectacles in the levels. The Hub World, for example, is the only level that really stands out, since DK's island is in the shape of his head, and K. Rule's boat fortress is in the shape of himself, a giant menacing crocodile with a crown on its head. I wish the levels themselves had those unique aesthetics and showcasings that the developers had fun with, but it's just not the case. It's just your average, very bland desert area or industrial area, and this is the game's biggest flaw in my opinion. The gameplay itself is still super fun and there's a lot to see and do, but the levels themselves are not your main motivation for this. So yeah, in the end, I would say that Donkey Kong 64 is still worth your time and a great joy to be had if you love platformers but probably only after you have visited other classics from Rare like Banjo-Kazooie and Congress Bad Fur Day. Donkey Kong 64 in the end gets an 8.2. And with that, my final review for the year 2020 is done. I will do one more video this year, where I will talk about my top favorite games of the year, and then hopefully come back with many more reviews in the year of 2021. I hope you all have a very wonderful Christmas despite the circumstances that the world is in now, so I wish you all the best and please stay safe. Merry Christmas everybody!